All right. Um, welcome to our first attempt at a podcast. Um, what we're going to be doing with this specific podcast series called Better is um, we're going to add on to and go deeper on Pastor's Teaching from Wednesdays, which is, again, the series called Better, which is a in-depth look, verse-by-verse, verse, hermeneutical approach to uh, studying what Hebrews has to say to us and hit on why is it important to do verse-by-verse verse, and what is hermeneutical uh, studies. What is that? So that's what we're going to tackle today. But this is Beyond Better, Episode 1. Let me just kind of say hello to everyone. And we've been looking forward to doing this for a long time. Pastor Michelle, Pastor Bailey and I, we've been dreaming about this for, for quite a long time, yeah. actually. And uh, we got a room prepared. We've purchased some equipment. So we recognize today might be a little rough. We hope it comes off well. And the camera work may not be perfect, but honestly, uh, we anticipate most of you will be listening to this maybe in your car, right. uh, right. listening on yeah. your AirPods while you're mowing the yard, something like that. <laughs> so the um, video is really not that important, although you can see all of our beautiful <laughs> smiling faces. So that's that's a big plus. But uh, we are interested in the in the audio primarily. Right. And uh, technically, that's what a, a podcast really is. Um, so yeah, uh, verse by verse in the Bible. Uh, it's the best way to study, in, in my opinion, because of a lot of reasons. But you get the context of the scripture, you get the continuity of the scripture, you get what is, uh, I guess we can be a little technical here, right. because uh, people want to learn. And we'll talk about Hebrews, but our, our purpose is not to rehash everything I said on Wednesday night. Right, you know, if right, you want right. to hear everything I said Wednesday night, that's <laughs> available too on this same podcast channel, and you can listen to it. Uh, why do verse by verse? Uh, verse by verse is what we call expositional teaching, exposition of the Bible. Uh, and that primarily ensures that you do what would be called exegesis rather than eisegesis. Right. Exegesis means reading out of the scripture. Eisegesis, eisegesis would mean reading into the scripture. And um, I want you guys to you know comment and chime in because <laughs> they'll hear my voice a lot. But one of the things that used to drive me crazy and I'm sure you guys have always been in these Bible studies where uh, people have never read the passage. They don't know what it means. They've never studied the context. They have no idea uh, who wrote it or anything about it. But the typical Bible study is, okay, we're all going to read uh, John 3, 16, and we're going to read one verse. Now, Michelle, what does that mean to you? Pastor Bailey, what does that verse mean to you? And, you know, the uh, response is generally, well, you know, never ever thought about it. It's an interesting verse. Um, I, I'm feeling this about it right now. Right. And, and right. they'll just make some off-the-wall comment, well, this is how I feel about right. this verse of right. Scripture. Right, like, like an unconfident answer. You're like, maybe, well, it could potentially mean this. And then the other person's like, wow. It's like, well, right. it's not really wow. You kind of just looked at the face value. We want to you know, dig deep and see what the original right. meaning right. was and then how it applies to us today. Right. And it's not so much what it means to you as what it means. Right. What is it saying? What yeah. God is saying. <laughs> what the text really says. Yeah. I have extremely, I hope this is evident, extremely, extremely high opinion of the Word of God. I believe that it is totally God's Word. Right. I made this statement the other night, and someone asked me about it. I thought they probably knew, but I've made this statement a lot. The Bible doesn't just contain the Word of God. It is the Word of yeah. God. Right. Yeah. Uh, that means that not only is revelation of truth in there, but the way it's put together, the structure, the content, the context, the flow of it, this is a book, I'll give you a quote that my Bible mentor used to say years and years ago. He says, if God is big enough to create a billion times a billion worlds, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the planets, I have no problem whatsoever believing that he can write a book that says exactly what he wants it <laughs> right. to say. Yeah. Right. I just love that quote. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's that, you know, there's always those sports teams even thinking of another example that you know right philippians 4 13 and they're like we're about oh, to yeah. go up against right. a tough opponent yeah. i can do all things through christ <laughs> right. who strengthens me right. it's like well that's not 
like what Paul was saying. <laughs> he wasn't saying for your right. football team that, you know, you can beat this other team right. when you read the context. He's like, you know, I know what it is to have a lot. I know what it is to have little. I know right. what it is to mm. be in all these circumstances. Yeah. And because of that, now I'm convinced that I can do all things through Christ who right. strengthens me because at the end of the day, it's not my own strength, it's Christ. Yeah. And it's like that that context. Right. Of, you don't want to apply the Bible loosely. Like you're saying sports, like you heard all those people saying, you're like, oh, I'm praying for my team or yeah. I'm doing this. I'm pretty yeah. sure with the fan bases of any <coughs> big sport nowadays, there's someone praying for their team. Right. So it's like, what, God didn't like the other person? Like, yeah. you know, there's more Christians on this team that God likes, so that team won. <laughs> right. But these Christians are not so good. Yeah. So God- <laughs> I would throw this out as a caution, though, because we would never discourage someone from reading the Bible. Right. Sure. You know, right. if we take Absolutely. this intellectual approach to an extreme, which sometimes has been done, then a person says, well, I'm not a scholar. I don't know everything about the history of the Bible, so I guess I can't read it for myself. You know, that's the beauty of the Bible, the multiple levels of revelation. If a person has never read the Bible at all, they could read John 3, 16. They don't know who John is. They don't know who he said it to. They don't know what love is in the biblical you know, definition, God's covenant keeping, self-giving, yeah. self-sacrificing, agape, right. you know, all those layers, they may not know that, but they could get the simple message that God right. loves yeah. people. Absolutely. And uh, so, but, you know, here at Family First, um, we're, we're not the surface church. Right. We're not just interested in the, the surface level uh, yeah. revelation. Yeah. Right. And I think that's where the hermeneutics really comes in, because the point of us talking about this today is to... Um, open people's eyes and equip them that, hey, you can take the Bible yourself, and this is the approach on how to study it. Now, we're just, you know, holding everyone's hand, and we're going to go through Hebrews hermeneutically, or pastors on Wednesdays, and then we kind of expound here on the podcast, but that's the whole point of hermeneutics. (coughs) Anyone, if you take your time and search for the context, you can figure it out yourself. And I mean, that's where the big Protestant movement came from, you know, it's like, there's all these religious leaders that are telling you what the Bible means, and their interpretation is the number one interpretation, and they could twist it and skew it, and if you don't have a Bible, you don't even know if that's true or not. You just follow them blindly, but here at Family First and a lot of modern-day churches, we we teach you what we believe the Bible says and then encourage you to look at it yourself and see if you agree or if you find even more, deeper, additional um, information on that. And so, you know, it's it's really important to read the Bible for yourself. And I think something that unfortunately a lot of people have done is they've taken all the aspects of our Christian walk and they've isolated each one and they've said, okay, if I have my own personal time, then I don't need community, I don't need mentors. If I have mm-hmm. community, then I don't need my personal time, I don't need mentors. Or if I have a mentor, then I don't. And the reality is you need all of it. Yeah. So you know, when you're studying the word, it's not that you're just studying God's word, but that when you come to something, you have a pastor or a mentor or someone that you can go to. If you're, you know, not a Bible scholar and you're not these things and you can go to someone and say, hey, I was reading this and I was a little bit confused Mm -hmm. about why, you know, this happened and this happened. Could you explain that to me a little bit more? So it's not even necessarily all up to you, but that's the reason for community. That's the reason for mentorship. And that goes hand in hand yeah. with studying the Bible. Very good. So to kind of get into what we want to cover today, um, it's basically to answer the question, why did I spend 60 minutes the other night introducing the book of Hebrews without even get to chapter one, verse one? You know, why did we spend all this time getting ready to study the Bible rather than just reading verse one and going around the room and saying, what does that mean to you? And uh, Pastor Michelle already gave the word this morning. It's because of a a, a, a discipline, a, a science and an art called hermeneutics okay <laughs> now we're trying to make this fun and you know how i am uh, i'm the i'm the dad joke guy so uh, what is hermeneutics is something guy a guy named herman wrote a book about <laughs> nudics or i mean what is hermeneutics hermeneutics is the art and uh science methods and principles of biblical interpretation okay methods and principles of biblical interpretation so i don't know if we want to kind of Throw that that um, definition around a little bit, sure. or, or just uh, kind of jump into it. Yeah. So, 
And I, I completely understood what you said, but I also took a hermeneutics class in college. So maybe like to kind of really oversimplify it. Um, the way I would explain hermeneutics to someone is hermeneutics is how to read the Bible, yes. how to study the Bible, right. how to look deeper into it, such as um, we've talked about this several times, the fire Bible is such a powerful tool. Right. And that's because if you go to the book of Hebrews, it'll have an intro as like one or two pages. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you like who they think wrote it, at which time it was written, right. at which culture, which people. And then the context all of a sudden changes because if you know who it was written to, then you know why the writer took a certain tone, why right. he made certain references and so on. Um, so again, hermeneutics is how um, to read and study the Bible. So here's a good opening statement. With so many different opinions on the Bible's interpretation, it may seem impossible to draw the right conclusions. However, just as God desires to communicate with mankind, he also intended for his word to be understood. Right. So biblical hermeneutics can help you grow confident in studying God's word and interpreting scripture. Right. Uh, and that's another simple statement a mentor taught me. Uh, God really wants people to understand. Right. It, it's not a book of, of uh, catchy, inspirational stories. <laughs> it's not just um, fables. It's not so scientific that you got to have a degree to understand it. God want, and, and this was specifically said in the context of the book of Revelation, Revelation and the whole Bible is a book that God wants people to understand. Right. 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 Well, and there's a, a verse, I, I believe it's in either first or second Corinthians, and it talks about like, who can know the thoughts of a man except the, the spirit of that man? Mm -hmm. And it's almost the same thing with God's word then of, okay, if God's word is his thoughts, his, his word to us, then his spirit, which now lives inside of us, is going to interpret that for us. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the coolest things, I, I like what you're saying with, the, with, with hermeneutics, the spirit will interpret it. Oftentimes I've heard um, you know, people say like, oh, I had this dream that, that God gave me. Oh, I, God spoke this to me. I read this the other day and I'm just a little bit confused. Right. And I've heard someone say this and since then this is the same advice I give. It's like, did you ask the Holy Spirit what that meant? <laughs> like, I never thought about that. Right. And then you know, I'll do that too. And sometimes you get confused and you're like, God, what does that mean? And and then sometimes you get the answer right away, and it's like he just wanted you to right. almost like ask the spirit, like dig deeper, and then he'll get the answer. And sometimes it's not there, and that's when you dig in and physically study it out, you right. know? So we'll jump into the process, and I actually have four uh, steps of this process that I'm going to outline for you. But here's the purpose, so that you know what hermeneutics is all about. The purpose of biblical hermeneutics is to understand what the scriptures communicated to the original audience and what timeless principles and applications there are for us. We need to understand this to live in line with the truth that God has revealed. Right. So it's not what it says to me per se. I mean, it does speak to me, but it's what was communicated in the culture, in the language, in the setting by the person yep. that spoke it originally, because that's the right. deepest level of revelation. So it's reading out of the word rather than reading right. into the word. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I think if I can just say something real quick on that, I think to the one of the important reasons for that is there's something that's sweeping across our culture called circumstantial morality, mm. which is you have a certain moral until there's a, cer a certain circumstance and then suddenly everything changes. Right. Mm. And yeah. when we read into God's word into what did it say to the original audience right. and things, then that completely just erases. It's not about my circumstances, it's not what about it, what it says or means to me, right. because what I'm feeling today is gonna change tomorrow. Yeah but it, it completely eradicates circumstantial morality as too because it doesn't change. So here's the four steps of the whole process. I'll read them all to you and we'll try to track back through each one. Number one, understanding the historical and cultural context. Number two, understanding the, literal, the, the literary context. Number three, then making observations. And then number four, drawing an application. So we wanna know when it was spoken, who it was spoken to, what the world was like when it was spoken to them, then what kind of a book it's in, what's the literary context, and then we're gonna stop and say, okay, we got all this information, let's let's start making some observations. It's almost like the scientific, uh, you know, you do your research and then you make a hypothesis 
and then you start testing it out. Could this really be true or not? Right. And then the ultimate uh, goal is that we draw the application to us, but we know now it is a... Um, it's an accurate application right. because it's been processed through right. this right. proven method. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So first would be what? Historical and cultural <laughs> context. So, um, and this is where we can get into the book of Hebrews, just to kind of use it as a frame of reference. First question we would want to ask ourselves in any book of the Bible is, who's the author? Right. Okay. Who wrote this? I don't know. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Um, I mean, I didn't. I didn't study this out, but I know Hebrews is one of the books where people are actually questioning. They they're not one hundred percent sure. Right. right. Who wrote right, it? Right. Yeah. And I went into that quite a bit on the Wednesday night teaching. And I know you guys are busy on Wednesday nights doing youth ministry and young adult. I looked at the wrong guy <laughs> doing youth ministry and young adult ministry. But um, we do into that quite a bit. Probably most people on a surface level, believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, mm -hmm. just simply because he wrote so much of the rest <laughs> of the uh, New Testament. And it, it kind of is laid out like an epistle. It's kind of somewhat similar in the structure to his other epistles, sure. writing to a particular church, to a particular right. people, in a particular context. But um, I, for one, have drawn my line in the sand uh, pretty strongly. <laughs> I do not believe that the Apostle Paul right. wrote uh, the book of Hebrews. Um, now, of course, the Word of God is the Word of God. So right. does it really matter sometimes, not saying all the time, but does it really matter sometimes if we're not sure who the author is, if, you know, someone's opinion, it's Paul, someone says it's someone else, it's like, well, who's correct? It's like, Well, we well, can that, all still read Hebrews and still get... That's actually meaning. a very important question, especially in contemporary circles, because there are people today that will say, some, uh, there's a technical term for it, I don't really know what it is right off, but they'll basically say, unless Jesus wrote it, unless Jesus said it, it it's not really right. authoritative. Only the red uh, letters count. Th that, that's what they say. <laughs> wow. It's basically, right. a, a, they basically, it's something like that, a red letter interpretation or something. Wow. So basically... Because Jesus spoke compassionately, he spoke very tenderly. Of course, he spoke a lot of harsh words right. of rebuke as well. <laughs> but they like those people like to take out the Apostle Paul's uh, instructions about morality wow. and a lot of other things. Well, Jesus never really said this, so I don't think it's right. all that important. Uh, how are we going to handle that? I think any done, anything done with the justification of sin is is because those people who are are usually when they do that are attempting Absolutely. to justify some sort of thing that Definitely. they're convicted about in their life. Absolutely. And so I think anything done with the motive of justification of trying to justify yeah. something you know is wrong is just always going to be a red flag. And so we're going to say uh, 1 Timothy 3.10, I think that's right, is brought into this all scripture, right? whether it right. came from uh, Jesus, whether it came from the Apostle Paul, whether it came from John, whether it came from Peter, it ultimately came from the Holy Spirit. Right. Holy men of God, Second Peter, holy men of God spake as they were breathed upon by the Holy Spirit. Right. Inspiration is, is God breathed. Right. So every scripture, regardless of the human author, came from the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, so... Yeah, that doesn't mean that we're asking who the author is to say whether we should listen to them. Right. We're asking who the author is so that we could know more about who he is and the people that he spoke to yeah. and the life that he lived in his cultural context yeah. because right. then his words might be right. uh, meaning so different things. I guess this, this still goes with number one, with historical. Because we are questioning <laughs> and we don't know 100% you know, who the author is, I mean, you could make it a fun game to tell, I'm going to dig deep. I'm going to figure out, like, who <laughs> is the highest percentage of this person right. wrote it. Sure. Right. I mean, you know, we all geek out about different things. You can do that. But on a spiritual level, let's just move on. If we're not 100% sure who the author is, what's the next step of still getting good context? It's right. like, well, when was it written? Right. You yes. know, because then cultural-wise, 
um, and where was it written? So mm -hmm. cultural-wise, we still know the general gist is this is what people's opinions were. This is right. their level of, of understanding. This is what they did culturally. So then we still kind of get a feel for the author because we know his culture. We know his time. Right. We know his land that he came from. So I know we have that information. Um, we know it was what, before um, AD 70? Exactly, it was before right. AD 70. How do we know that? Because the writer of the Hebrews talks about sacrifices that were still being offered. We know historically proven fact that in AD 70, Titus, the emperor of Rome, came in and they destroyed the city. Right. Uh, that's what Jesus uh, prophesied in Matthew 24 when he's sitting on the Mount of Olives with the disciples. They're looking across the Kidron Valley and he said, I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left upon another. All these will be torn down. That was probably 30, 40 years that Jesus said that before it happened, but the Romans came in and devastated the right, temple, right. tore down the whole temple mountain. And consequently, sacrifices ceased. Right. So uh, this is what we'll get into later on in the book, particularly about the animal sacrifices. But uh, I, I guess everybody knows, but maybe you haven't really thought, stopped to think about it. There are no animal sacrifices in Israel today. Right. right. Haven't been for 2,000 years. Right. Because there's not a temple to sacrifice in, and they can't sacrifice without an altar, without a temple. Now, um, we believe that that will resume right. mm -hmm. at some point, and there are plans being made now to rebuild the temple and get all the instruments and all of the uh, articles that are used for temple sacrifice, the particular trumpets that will be blown, the particular uh, garments that the priests will wear, right. all of that is being prepared. It will be reinstituted someday because uh, we believe that in the book of Revelation, Antichrist will desecrate the temple. So there has to be a temple right. for him to, right. to mess up. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we're yeah. kind of off topic there a little bit. But. <laughs> well, I mean, it, I think it explains, again, like not a lot of people have taken a hermeneutics course. So, like, you know, how, well, how do people know when it was written and this and that? Because, honestly, these scrolls, they... Honest, they didn't even have the author's name on it sometimes. It would literally just sure. be right. the, the scripture. There would be mm -hmm. no verses. There'd be no chapters. It didn't right. say, I wrote this, and this is the date. Um, people didn't do that. <laughs> Luckily, we do that today, even yeah. when we take church notes. You know, yeah. you wrote, you write down today's <laughs> date. I'm at Family First Church, and this mm, is the pastor speaking. speaking. Yeah. Um, they didn't do that back then. So um, the way that the historians and theologians figure out the date or uh, approximation of the date is looking at what the person says. Okay, Context. he said... Okay, this event happened, um, but he didn't talk about that event yet, and that couldn't have happened if this and that. So there's a lot of if and thens, and they kind of just, that's why there's usually a range. Like you'll say Hebrews was written between this date and that date. Now, it didn't take 20, 30 years to write, but we know it's somewhere in these years right. because this event was talked about, this one hadn't happened yet. And that's how they figured it's that out. It's too bad in that day right. they didn't have what we have today, metadata, yeah. where like when you, when, you, when you take a picture, Digitally, it's recorded on that file when you took that picture right. at the date and the time. And if you have the GPS tracking turned on on your phone, it'll tell you where, where? you were at when you took right. that picture. So, yeah. Right. So, uh, okay. So that's very important. But here's another, not only the author and, and the context, that who he wrote it to and when he wrote it, but this is another thing that we can talk a little, little bit, the different type of of scripture it is, the literary right. style. So what are the different kinds of pieces of literature we have in the Bible? Uh, well, there's poetry, poems, right? There's poems, poetry. songs, history. which are more like songs. Right, yeah. history. There's history. Just the Torah. Yeah. You got the prophets. The prophets. Um, we letters, got the wisdom epistles. literature. Yeah, wisdom We got literature. Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Proverbs. Yeah. Those are Those are the wisdom uh <laughs> books um, um we've got the gospels right and Reve we've got revelation the book of revelation yeah. which again we'll throw out some big <laughs> words if that's okay um yeah. books that talk about the end times are called yeah. eschatological books that's, what they're called. I uh, the word. that's particularly revelation daniel. and daniel yeah. mm -hmm. they talk about the future they talk about eschatology uh books like um the kings and the chronicles and then even in the New Testament, the Gospels. And that's what I wanted to talk about this one a little bit because I just think it's important. Those are called narratives. Right. So here's the question, and uh, this could be a whole other podcast. <laughs> but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, did they write to prepare a strict 
historical record of the life of Christ. No. That's right. I think Luke did Luke, because I think in the beginning of his, he says that he did it specifically to gather, uh, I forget the exact word. More a wholesome it. account, like right. putting all the parts together. Putting everything together. Okay. Right. So uh, they wrote what we would call a narrative. Right. Now, the best way to illustrate a narrative would be all three of us witnessed an accident. Okay. Someone was driving down Spring Hill Drive. They hit an icy spot. Now, that would be fictitious here in Florida. <laughs> Florida. But they hydroplane. lost. Hydroplane. They, <laughs> they hydroplaned because there was three inches of water on the road. Their car spun around and they went into the ditch. They were from New okay. York. Okay. We'd say, Pastor Michelle, what happened? Oh, I didn't see the water, so I'm just assuming the guy just swerved hard. He was probably on his phone. He was driving <laughs> reckless. You know, this guy didn't know how to drive. Okay. I saw a yellow taxi that actually cut him off okay. and made him swerve. And then there was a lady in the road who was, like, jaywalking. And Okay. Now, all of that could be true. All of those elements could have very well been there. But just because Michelle mentions part of it and Bailey mentions other parts of it doesn't mean they were telling uh, two different accounts. Right. They were describing the same account from their perspective. And uh, a narrative is written for a purpose. Like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all written to particular audiences. Right. Matthew is the scribe. He is the Jew. He's writing primarily to the Jews to tell them that Jesus is the king. So he talks about the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. He presents Jesus as the king. He doesn't get into a lot of the other stuff. And, you know, the higher critics would say, well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, particularly the synoptic gospels, they should all be exactly the same. No, not really, because <laughs> right. they're not written for the same purpose. Right. Uh, they're telling the same stories, but from different perspectives. Right. Well, and that's also where it's interesting when you then look into the authors, because the book of Luke, when you look into Luke's occupation, he's right. a doctor. And yeah. so then when you look at the miracles, that the physical healing miracles that Jesus performed, Luke has a much more detailed description right. of what was going on in those miracles, mm -hmm. which again comes from yeah. that digging into who the author is right. and the, the historical context of it. And uh, Mark will just follow that up since we don't leave anybody hanging. Mark was written <laughs> uh, Matthew to the Jews, Luke basically to the to the Greeks right. because they were interested in humanity. They had a high value of the human body, etc. Uh, Mark written to the Romans. They were all about conquest and action and warfare and domination. It's the shortest book. Uh, it's all about action. And then John may mostly written to the, the, the Christians. Right. And that's why he gets into the devotional things of, about Jesus. So, so anyway, maybe that's, that's enough on that. Then the second question uh, we would ask ourselves, we, or third, we've asked ourselves the historical and cultural setting. We've asked ourselves the literary context. Then we're going to stop and make some observations. Okay? So... We're going to start asking ourselves, what, what words does the writer to the Hebrews repeat over and over? Yep. And um, I'll ask uh, those of you that <laughs> heard Wednesday night, what's the key word of the book? Better. Yeah, that's the, <laughs> that's the title of our series, Better. So I don't mean to make this simplistic, but at the same time, it is simple. Right. What's one of the themes then of the whole book of Hebrews? Better, better coming. I think um, part of that too is though. I don't know. I don't know if it's in the latter steps, but it, in order to get a good understanding and context and have good observation, um, it's good to read things in whole or or in their chunk. You know, like we talked about the Synoptic Gospels. Mm -hmm. You necessarily have to read all of Mark or all of Luke. Now, if you did, you'll have a even greater context. But you can read, you know. Oh, when Jesus fed the 5,000. But read the right. whole story before you just take the first verse. I think it means this. Read the full story, then reread, reread re -read again verse by verse. And as Pastor said, right. you know, he's done Hebrew several times. It was one of his college have, projects. Right, and right. so he's digested the whole thing. So now he can take us verse by verse because he knows what the whole picture is. Right. And then we can zoom in onto the each pixel in a sense, you know, right. and see what it, good. what it means. Yeah. Um, so I think observation is important. 
um, after we've read the whole thing, and then again go. Uh, so if he this. uses this word better over and over again, if I remember correctly, about thirteen times, he's telling us that what is now, what we have in Christ, is right. better mm -hmm. than what used to be. Yeah. Yeah. So what's what's and we could go back maybe uh, reverse our our process a little bit. Who did he write it to? He wrote it to the Hebrews. Who's a Hebrew? Hebrew is a person that is Jewish. Um, uh, Abraham was the first person called a Hebrew. It means one who crosses over because he came out of Ur the Chaldees and he crossed over into the Canaan land. So then Hebrew became a person that was Jewish, one that had crossed over. So. Uh, whoever this author is, and and we really don't know. Uh, there's a lot of theories, but we, we're just going to leave it the writer to the Hebrews. Right. He wrote to these people that were very Jewish in origin. They knew the commandments. They knew the laws. Yep. They knew the prophets. They knew all about the animal sacrifices. They had it all down to a science. And then he's going to come along and he's going to say, that's great. Don't don't ever forget that. In fact, later on in the book, he talks about moving on from the ABCs. He says, that's great, but now what we have in the New Covenant, right. in the New Testament, is better because now it's fulfilled. Right. What was uh, put into um, prophetic context and futuristic context, the foundations of everything that was laid in the Old Testament is now fulfilled in Christ. Right. So it's, it's better. Right. It's a better covenant. We have better promises. Uh, we have a better sacrifice. Mm -hmm. We have a better atonement. The blood of Jesus is so much better than what the blood of the animals were, right. uh, et cetera. So it's important there to, you know, if it was written to the Hebrews, I'm obviously not, well, I don't know if it's obvious, but I'm not Jewish. Um, <laughs> but I don't, Michelle, I don't, I don't know a lot of not. context from that, right? I, I don't have a lot of context culturally. I have not experienced an animal sacrifice. And as we talked about, there hasn't really been any in 2,000 years. But either way, I haven't experienced that. I've not done a formal Passover meal. I, I've not en enriched myself in that culture as right. deep as a true Jewish person sure. would have. So therefore, if the whole theme is things are better than the old Jewish traditions. They're even better. Not that those things are bad, but it's better in order to have that context. And then the the, the, the contrast, I kind of have to know some of the, the history. Right. So if he compares it to, like you said, the you know, sacrifice, right. you know, like Jesus's atonement is far better than the past ones. Then I'd have sure. to look in, what are, well, what are the past ones? Like, oh right. man, every time you sinned, you'd have right. to go to the temple, That's bring right. an animal, right. and you're like, I lost another animal. Right. <laughs> sure. and, you know, it's, and, and then you'd have to do it every time. Right. Jesus died once. We didn't have to get hundreds of Jesuses sent to die for Praise us. God. You know? right. yeah. Praise so God. then all of a sudden you're like, that is a right. lot better. <laughs> well, and two, Amen. you know, I heard someone say one time, um, he was talking about his past, and he was like, you know, I used to be so excited. Like we all have our heroes that when we read through God's word, we're like, oh man, like King David was the coolest guy in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone's, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven. Yes, you know, because we'll be in heaven with Jesus forever, but I can't wait to just have a conversation with David and to ask him, like, what was it like defeating Goliath and stuff? <laughs> and he said he had a revelation one day and he was like, as I was thinking about it, what's probably going to happen is instead of me running up to David and being like, what was it like? David is probably gonna run up to me hmm. and be like, what was it like living under the fulfilled covenant, the, wow. the not just the That's visitation awesome. of the Holy Spirit, but Praise like, God. what was it? Cause he never got to experience that because right. Right. in Hebrews, he's like, that was great. But what we have now mm -hmm. is even Greater. better. Mm -hmm. and, That's and a so great that was thought, kind Pastor of a, Bailey. I like cool that. Thought. I like that a lot. So in another sense, we'll ask ourselves, uh, what figures of speech does this author use? What are his illustrations? What is his frame of reference? And particularly in the book of Hebrews, what we know is his frame of reference is Jewish. His frame of reference is Old Testament. He figures of speech. He talks about covenants. He talks about, like I said already, he talks about sacrifices. He talks about priest, the priesthood. He talks about Moses. He talks about all of these uh, contextual things that help us gather these observations. So then the fourth point we're going to get is what are the applications? Okay, what does this mean 
to us today. And uh, that's where we're going to make our, our theological um, implications. Well, it means that if I'm living on this side of the cross, if I'm living in a day of better, if I'm living in a day of the new covenant that's not the same and it's so much better than the old covenant, then that means there's no reason why I can't live a strong, victorious Christian life because God is for me, not against me. The power of the Holy Spirit is inside of me. And then you could start quoting verses from Hebrews like the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper right. than any double-edged sword. It cuts the dividing of sunder of joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts yeah. and the intents yeah. of the heart. Yeah. Uh, you could get later on where it says, let us come boldly hmm. before the throne of grace right. that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Yeah. Amen. So good. we can just uh, have all that confidence in our lives. When I think to it, specifically talking about the the book of Hebrews and how he talks about the difference between the two covenants and things. I think even in today's church culture, we can get caught up in traditions. We may not have Jewish traditions or Jewish laws in place, but there are things that, you know, as the American church that we have kind of established as traditions that aren't bad, but mm-hmm. they're also not biblical and necessary for Holy Spirit to move or necessary for God to do something. Right. But we get caught up in tradition. And so then even that application of, okay, I may not be like mm-hmm. Pastor Michel was saying, I may not be of Jewish tradition. And so that aspect of the old covenant doesn't necessarily apply to me. However, there are traditions in my life that sometimes I can hold above you know, maybe what God is wanting to do or right. the new thing that he's wanting to do. And so the better then is saying, well, God is, is under the new covenant, what he wants to do, the new, when he says, I want to behold, I want to do a new thing. I've yes. a new creation right. that that's better for me mm-hmm. application wise than right. maybe some of the traditions or some of the yeah. old ways of thinking It's just a funny thing. I heard a mentor one time talking about, you know, there are people that say, oh, we don't have any traditions at our church. <laughs> oh yeah, our church is totally free spirited. We don't have any traditions. And then you go to those churches, they have no traditions, but you can look around and you can see traditions <laughs> everywhere. Right. Yeah. Maybe their traditions are different than another person's traditions, right. but man, they're all stuck in their, in their traditions. Right. Right. Um, Jesus said, there's only one thing. You got my, my mind thinking when you said <laughs> that. Jesus said, there's only one thing that can nullify the word of God. You know what that is? Man's tradition. Hmm. He said, you set apart the word of God by your traditions. He told the Pharisees that. I I guess you're kind of saying the same thing, you know, like the traditions in in themselves, especially in in the Christian church and and in the Jewish times, when the tradition first started, most of the time, it had incredible meaning. It was very important. But then over time, it just becomes nullified it becomes a tradition for the sense of oh this is what we do we don't really know why we do it anymore but we do it and Mm -hmm. one of those examples recently was um marith and i we had gone to uh savannah georgia and we had visited another church because we were on vacation it was over a sunday and we're like let's visit another church (laughs) and it was completely different denomination every everything (laughs) pretty much the opposite right and uh, it was a very traditional very old school uh type church and what they did though is they would they would read a psalm or sing a song and then read a scripture and go back and forth mm. back and forth and it was very traditional but the first time they went to open up the bible they had you know one of their leaders come up he grabbed the bible lifted it high asked everyone to stand That's up cool. and then the other guy was praying and you know basically they just honored the word That's and cool. i was like right. this is incredible <laughs> like I, ha- I had goosebumps because i i'm almost walking into a tradition knowing the meaning of it, but experience it for the first right. time. I'm like, man, this is so meaningful. But I bet That's you cool. there's hundreds of people in that room that are probably like, yeah, this is what we do every week. Right, right, exactly. Right. Who cares? Right. I cared. I was like, oh my, like I almost got emotional. <laughs> right. It's like, and it's just, again, it was a very traditional church. It was very quiet. You could, you know, hear a pin drop. This guy's lifting up the Bible and he just does a prayer. But to me, I'm like, I'm seeing right through the tradition of like the original meaning. Like, wow, right. this is incredible. So again, like traditions aren't bad, but there's something better beyond it. Right. And we have to look at the origin. We like look at the mm-hmm. context of that thing and never lose it. Like what you're saying with it's Hebrews, good, right? don't lose 
what you had and don't lose the meaning behind it, but let's add on to it and move on. Right. Sure. That's cool. I'll just throw this in there. That's cool about lifting up the Word of God because that's what we do. Right. Uh, we are uh, declaring there's no authority that can compare with the Word of God. Right. There, there was a uh, time in history in the early church where they were all about the presence. Now, we honor the presence too. Don't right. misunderstood. The, the, the presence of Jesus is very important. But in their tradition, they didn't have the presence necessarily like we do in praise and worship and in uh, maybe manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But the presence was really brought to them in the communion time right. where the body and the blood of the Lord brings that, that sense of God is really here. So consequently, at some points in the early Early church, they put their communion table in the center of the building, and all the all the seats were uh, around mm -hmm. the communion table. The communion table was the center, so they yeah. elevated that part of the service. Right. Well, in Protestantism now, of course, and Pentecostals or Evangelicals, probably most any Bible preaching church uh, has a platform, and now we elevate the pulpit right. because that's symbolically we're elevating the Word of God. Right. Now, uh, obviously, we want to balance because right. we do want to elevate the presence as well. That's why we would uh, take probably half of our service, honestly, 45 minutes or so of the presence, praise and worship, public prayer, uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to uh, speak to people's lives, and then, of course, another 45 minutes or sometimes a, a, a little bit more to uh, to the preaching. Right. Yeah. So, right. yeah. Well, I think the preaching, honestly, the reason why it's usually longer is because it's not just presence and the word, but like we're learning here with hermeneutical, the word is reading it, but then what does it mean? How do we apply it? So it's almost like really it's half an hour of what does the Bible say? And then, I mean, we don't necessarily read the Bible and then apply it. We're applying it as we're reading it. You know, when you have a right. sermon, it goes here and there. But really, almost like half of your sermon is telling people, well, this is what it says. And the other half right. is like, right. therefore, now we must do these things. Right. So it's almost right. like a, that's the reason why the word part is so long, because it's not just the word that we're reading, but what does it now mean and how do we apply it? Right. And that's why we have, oh, generally, majority mm -hmm. of times have an altar call at the end. Um, you know, all, right. almost every time for salvation, right. but even just like that, that push and encouragement of like what the scripture said that day, be empowered to right. pray for healing. Okay, yeah. so let's pray that someone, God gives us a, uh, an opportunity this week to pray for someone right. and so mm -hmm. on. And you can, you can almost tell once you've been under teaching that is very hermeneutical and, you know, like you were saying, where most of the message is, this is what God's word is saying and then at the end, there's a, okay, so now this is what that means for us. Right. Then when you go to a church and Pastor Genesis and I noticed this, we, um, there was a, a church that we visited that was not like that. And it was, it was still Bible-based, but it was mm -hmm. read scripture and then straight into almost an application. And it felt very motivational speechy. Mm -hmm. It was very... Um, get people hyped up and, and thing, sure. which, you know, when, of course we get our emotions involved, we get the spirit involved, we, you know, that that's not a bad thing, but when you skip over that, here's what God's word says right. and what it means for that context and for that time. Yeah. And when you skip over that, it, you can, first mm -hmm. of all, tell after you've been in a hermeneutical church for a little while, but then also, yeah, there is like almost a, a motivational, like, right. you right. know, TED talk kind of feel to it. To me, the, the visual is almost like a football coach at halftime. You're down a little bit. He talks to you. Well, the football coach that just hypes you up but gives you no strategy. Right. <laughs> you might do a little bit better because your morale is right. up for five minutes, but then so we, you still fail. But then if if you have the coach that is just strategy and doesn't hype you up, you still, your morale is down. You need both. You need, right. here's your strategy. And now let's do it. We can right. do it. Yeah. So obviously we always re leave room for the, presence of the Holy right. Spirit, uh, even in the in the preaching time, as well as praise and worship time. And there, I can't even begin to describe to everyone how often 
the Holy Spirit will give me something while I'm preaching right. that was not right. on my radar screen. It was not in my notes. I, I hadn't even planned to say it. And to be honest with you, sometimes those are the best the best <laughs> statements right. of the whole message right. because it's it's fresh from the Holy Spirit. And uh, I I like to say that um, that's the prophetical element of right. of a service. Uh, I've got someone in the church, and I won't mention his name lest he think I'm uh, trying to mess with him. But he wants to always uh, tell me I'm not a preacher; I'm a teacher. <laughs> and uh, so we have this whole thing going back, and I tell him, well, teaching should be prophetic, right. and preaching should also be contextual. So right. there really is a balance, but the thing that is most thrilling is when you have that prophetic element, mm, right. and the Holy Spirit just right. takes that and brings it all together. Which kind so. of brings us back to the beginning where Bailey was saying, you know, sometimes you just read the scriptures and you're like, Spirit, just speak to me. What does it say? Right. Because... God. Sometimes, you know, someone can read something and God just instantly gives it to you. You understand it. You didn't have to go to, you know, Bible college to understand this chapter. Right. Um, and then sometimes it does take the studies. But um, we're kind of getting really, really far into it, and, and we do need to wrap up, so we have more to talk about next time. <laughs> right, um, right. So let's make some closing statements. Um, for one of mine, I know it's going to be a little bit longer, but I wanted to give an example of what bad hermeneutics is. Good. And that is um, in college, we had a speech right. professor, and he just shared a testimony that when he was younger, in high school, he was always bullied and abused, and then he kind of like found... Um, you know, older brothers in a sense in school that took that took care of him, and he got eventually sucked into a cult before he even realized what was going on. And it, it was a big, strong hate group. And either way, he didn't realize what was going on. He just knew he was protected. Now he had a family, and mm -hmm. so he went through the ranks. And eventually, he was actually one of the the leaders. And his role then was, hey, here's a Bible. We want you to now teach what what our lessons are. Wow. But it was a real Bible, right? And um, so he's like, okay. So one of the number one stories that they always taught was the Good Samaritan. So he's like, yeah, I'll teach that one <laughs> because that's that's one of our favorite ones. And then as he reads the Bible for the first time for himself and reads the whole context of the Good Samaritan, he's like, oh my goodness, we've been lying to everyone because wow. we're not telling the whole story. So here's the story. Obviously, we all know the story of the Good Samaritan is one of the most popular Christian stories. Um, you know, there, there's someone on the road bleeding and, and they're dirty on the ground. They need help. They're probably going to die if no one helps. And Everyone just walks by, the the legal people walk by, religious people walk, just all kinds of people just walk by. And in their version, they would just stop there and then wow. say, so therefore, <laughs> what the Bible says is if you see someone dirty bleeding on the ground, just let them be. It's not worth it. It's not worth wow. it to dirty yourself up. Wow. If you're a religious leader or if you're someone in the wow. legal system, don't bother with the lower people. And huh. so they would teach that, but of course, when he read it in context, at the end, someone right, comes right. does clean him up, and that's the whole wow. point. You need to be the good Samaritan. You need to be the person that is willing to sacrifice your time, <laughs> your money. Geez. And so he's like, <laughs> "Wow," scary. he's like, "I need to leave this place." Right. And um, yeah. now everything's turned around. You know, several years later, but he always jokes around and now. He's like, "God's humor is amazing," because. Now his, his history is that he's basically a pastor of a multiracial church, and he's like very together. You know, it's not. Um, uh, where he came from. Right. So I'll just jump into that. I'll give a little comment and then we'll throw it to Pastor Bailey to close because we are kind of uh, coming to our uh, where we thought might be an accurate period of time. But concerning the, the Good Samaritan, that's a really good point. In addition to what you said, a lot of people could read that story and put it in the context that the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? Mm -hmm. And then we have the Good Samaritan story. But they miss something else that is in there. The, the man didn't ask, what can I do to get saved? And then Jesus said, oh, go help somebody on the road that's bleeding and dying. And that's how you get saved. Right. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right. That's how you can follow righteousness and then the man asked this, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus told the Good Samaritan right. the story in answer to who is my neighbor, not in answer to what I can do to get saved. Right. And that would be another point that people could say, oh, well, this guy came to Jesus and said, what can I do to get saved? And, he, and Jesus tell him, go, go find all the hurting people in the world and bandage up their wounds and pay their, pay their doctor bills and be a really good Joe, and that's how you get saved. And 
that's not what Jesus right. said. Right. There's um, a verse in Second Timothy two. A friend of mine shared this with me, and I, I kind of got revelation from it. But Second Timothy two fifteen, it says, uh, "Do your best to present yourself as to God as one approved, a worker Man. who has no need to be ashamed." rightly handling the word of truth. Amen. And he said to me, if there's a right way to handle God's truth, there's also a wrong way to right. handle good. God's truth. Good. And so good. being careful about with hermeneutics, making sure that unlike, you know, your your um, guy that, that told that story, right? That we're, mm -hmm. we're rightly handling God's word. Right. And um, something, I'll close with this, something that a, a mentor of mine one time said, he said, imagine watching your absolute favorite movie. And he had been a Christian at this point for 30, you know, 35 years, quite a while. And he said, imagine watching your favorite movie every single morning for 30 years. <laughs> By year two, you would be just tired of watching that movie. It's no longer your favorite movie. Right. I absolutely hate it. Um, you would know every line to it, but it would no longer be your favorite movie. Mm -hmm. He said, God's word, we can read every single morning for as long as we could imagine. That's and we good. will still right. find new truth, not new truth, but new revelation. Sure. Um, and, and, and different things in it that God is revealing to us. Um, and part of that comes through those levels that we were talking about. If you can read it, one year and get kind of a surface level and then 30 years later because of maturing because of the context right. of god's word not just the book but the whole context of god's word then you're like oh my gosh this is like new very cool and, very cool and things so all right well thanks so much for everyone coming and being with us today and uh this is session number one we were kind of recapping last wednesday night's teaching on the book of hebrews where all we did for one whole hour was give an introduction to the book so this coming week we'll get into chapter one verse one and we'll continue to go through the book of hebrews so um, share the news of this podcast with your friends we want it to be fun we want it to be enjoyable that's why we have three good looking guys here at this <laughs> table that are handsome so uh yeah Share the news. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you guys for um, joining in again um, at what we're going to be calling Beyond. Um, so this series, again, is better. But this expounding, this going deeper into it is what we're going to call the Beyond Podcast. So this is Beyond Better, Episode 1. Thank you for joining us. See you in Episode 2. Peace out. See you.